Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Uh, thank you all for coming. It's a great pleasure to have with us today Audris Marcus. Audris is actually from Avaya Labs and he earned his PhD from Carnegie Mellon in Statistics. He spent uh, several years at Bell Labs and then at Avaya. He's actually going to talk to us today about digital archaeology of software. Thank you. Do is that, of course, rip it off. Okay, so very nice to be here, and uh, not the first time, hopefully, not the last. I'll start uh, from sort of high level stuff of why to measure, how to measure, what the hell is digital archaeology, and hopefully, give examples that illustrate it. Um, I wanted to start pretty early on because, you know, nowadays we're all kind of learn on technology, especially me, and never have time to read sort of the classics. And I think uh, we miss because I sort of started reading that recently and found that, you know, a lot of good ideas I had seemed to have been stolen from me, you know, 2,500 years ago. Anyway, so why measure? And uh, one point is I wanted to emphasize this <laughs> to save our life. And another point is uh, obviously to obtain exact knowledge of the past as well uh, as to aid interpretation of the future, which is at least resembles the past, if not reflects it. And um, so if I frame the research question in, in very general terms, and perhaps you would find that too general, but you'll see hopefully through the talk how it uh, uh, exemplifies into more specific ones, is that uh, basically through measurement obtain exact knowledge of the past for the purpose of interpretation of the future. And that's very important thing, thing is, is that the knowledge that's useful for interpretation of the future. And another part that I wanted to emphasize is that human think. And the human thinks tend to resemble themselves in the future, uh, while sometimes computer thinks don't. So, so those are kind of key uh, dimensions that I'll try uh, to address. And of course, you know, at the end of the day, well, at least, uh, you know, either save our lives or at least uh, be content. Uh, that's kind of the, my ultimate objective. Why software development? Why software development now? First, it's really, a, a, if you think about it carefully, it's a small reflection of actual life, but in a kind of more constrained, more specified, more frame, more contextual version of real life. It's also supported that tools that leave traces so we can actually measure what's going on much easier. Finally, it's really a maturing discipline that's uh, ripe, ripe for more reproducibility, and uh, uh, I see uh, in kind of near future the concept of thing like a just-in-time developer, sort of like call center operator who comes in, does the job. And for that, we really need to understand exactly what goes on, how good developers do their thing, and how perhaps not so good developers, why they don't achieve the, the productivity of the good ones. I wanted to go a little bit and say, why do I call it uh, digital archaeology? And I wanted to start from a basic point, is that if you look at definition, X is a study of past human events and activities. So we can ask a test. OK, Patrice, what's X? What is it? What is X? Accurate. Mm, it's history. Wrong. <laughs> OK. B is, uh, is archaeology. Uh, y is archaeology, in fact. Okay. Now, if I 
look at what I'm trying to do is, or many others in this room, is study of developer cultures and behaviors through recovery documentation and digital remains. You see that it really is somewhere between history and archaeology, except that it's dealing instead of sort of artifacts found in the ground, perhaps with the artifacts that are found on a computer disk recorded somewhere. Now, how do you do that? There's uh, one similarity, but it's superficial as always. There's a big difference. There are big differences as well. So one is that how do you actually analyze those remains differs. There you have physical remains. Here you have digital remains. And again, I would use analogy. So tomography, image reconstructions from multiple projections. So if you think about main method of how you deal of reconstruction, the past here from digital traces, you basically look at various projections and then you put them together, integrate into a single view that allows you to see the past. So it's sort of similar to tomography. Okay. So let me illustrate on really basic examples, hopefully very quickly so I won't bore you. These are the things that you really, most of you at least, really know very well. So tasks, tools, these are tools that leave traces, code tools, they leave traces, other tools, they leave traces. And they're all used in software development very heavily. For example, let's take tasks. You open create a task, perhaps because user complains, perhaps because you want to implement a feature. Uh, perhaps you just want to change the code and the process does not allow you to change the code just willy-nilly, you have to open the task. Then assign, self-assign a person to solve a task, then submit the code. Uh, then somebody verifies that it's okay, goes into release, everybody forgets it. Okay. So those are our example MR systems that deal with that. So what kind of traces do they live? So this is an example of a trace of uh, status changes in Bugzilla, bug number 412233. And we see a person who, when, what, and initial value and value. And, you set, and then you have a history of people that work on that. So that history of people, that history of states, that all is a traces of activity, a bug resolution that occurred for this particular bug. What we can do, we can extract the information about the sequence of people and construct a graph. For example, there was an instance where this developer uh, opened, perhaps created a bug, and this manager approved, verified it or approved it and so forth. And so we create a graph where each person in that history is linked to another person depending on the workflow. So in this case, it's not Mozilla. This is some, some uh, Avaya project with about uh, 50 developers uh, where you can kind of use that information to recreate actual workflow structure of the organization. So you see some managers that perhaps are responsible for testing and verifying. So squares are testers, uh, ovals are developers, and uh, Diamonds are sort of technical managers. So that's an example of reconstruction. So version control system, again, trivial example. There was a few lines of code with some bugs in them. They were fixed, comments added. So one line deleted, two lines added, two lines unchanged. Some other attributes, who, when, a comment, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So these are basic, uh, basic traces that are being left. And uh, uh, somebody, uh, so if you look at CVS log in this case, or nowadays it's, 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 it's Git log, you will see, okay, version, person, time, again, uh, who, when, and what happened. Uh, perhaps in this case it's linked to a bug, so you can easily uh, relate the code change to a bug. So that's, a, that's kind of a raw data. That's a trace that's left. And this is a really simple tool that takes that trace and creates something, back projects it into something that's useful. It says, okay, so these lines are created by dbaron in version this, these two lines are created by this person, and so forth. So you can see that this file is actually modified a lot and multiple people worked on that just by very quick look at it. But anyway, so it goes, uh, so it's a very simple reconstruction, but it is a reconstruction from those traces into something useful. I just wanted to mention there are many, many other systems, and perhaps you're familiar with version control and bug tracking. 
but uh, uh, org chart is one of the systems, sale, marketing, information, accounting, uh, maintenance, support, services, and so forth. All of those things are recorded in great excruciating detail. And basically right now the data is being thrown out for the most part. Well, what do you do? Well, how do you do this uh, archaeology? So select phenomena, observe, validate on a smaller scale, uh, design and validate models for, of, of the projection on that smaller scale because you really know what exactly happened from qualitative data. And that's different from archaeology, uh, archaeology because usually you can go back in time and figure out what's going on. And then uh, uh, apply suitable tomography methods and apply on a wider scale and then see you know, what happens, what the how things look on, you know, perhaps bigger things like ecosystem and so forth. So what I'll try to do, I'll illustrate one group of research questions that uh, form somewhat a story. Uh, and this starts from kind of individual level questions, asking about productivity, work transfer, productivity, goes to kind of project level questions at skills, collaboration, learning level goes even higher, leads to some questions that lead to even higher community, perhaps organization, like motivation of people, efficiency, innovation, and, uh, and you know, ends up with kind of society or entire human species type of uh, uh, level. And I, I, again, through beauty, these are in quotes. I'm, I'm really seeking this. I, I would like to seek that too. But I mean, according to at least Plato, you can't have knowledge without truth and beauty first because, you know, there's false knowledge and unbeautiful knowledge, and we don't want that. <laughs> so let's uh, look at, uh, let's start at the basic question. So let's take the context of global software development, why it's done, national policies, customer pre presence, local expertise, uh, easily electronic transfer of the product, available inexpensive telecom, Communications. I'll, I'll just give you an example. This is, wasn't given like in the 80s when Siemens started software development in US to be able to sell their switches. Uh, uh, they had the development lab in Florida and they, the, way, the way they did the synchronization of the code, they would ship with FedEx, uh, you know, 20 tapes with all the code from Florida to Munich and from Munich to Florida back. So uh, that was the way you de did the R-Sync in those days. So now, now, of course, it's a little bit different. Anyway, um, lack of qualified IT workers in some countries, uh, potential for lower costs. And again, I mentioned potential and potential for round-the-clock development. And to some extent, those are true. To some extent, those are false. But this is kind of complicated story. I won't go into that. The point is that here's the question. Now, let's see. Whom should I test? OK. Tom, how many locations globally distributed project may have? How many, how many locations? Different locations. For a single project? For a single project. Four. Okay. Four. <laughs> well, yeah, anybody can guess uh, some other number. What, what do you consider a location? <laughs> Is it one? I'm talking about, say. Uh, well, I mean, uh, uh, somebody develops city. software from some place, right? So that's oh. a location. We know that. that oh, okay, 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 okay. It's okay, a different okay. location. Okay. So, so there's some, some on the South Pole, by the way. <laughs> uh, so that's GNOME. Um, and actually, it's more than seven, or several hundred developers. But uh, this is a project that Tom knows really well. And you should have been able to give the answer correctly. This is 5ESS, and these are the main locations, each one with at least 100 people, many of them with more like 300 or 400 people. Uh, anyway, so, and some of them with uh, uh, perhaps in April with uh, uh, almost 2,000 people. Uh, developers actually working on the same piece of software. Um, okay, so funny things apart. So let's, uh, let's look at the question. So now we have this globally distributed software we need to put uh, development into a different location because of all those reasons that are beyond outside software development. There are business reasons, there are national politics reasons, all sorts of things. When we do that, somebody who developed software no longer does that. Somebody else develops that software. So we have this concept of succession. That is, transfer of ownership for developing some piece of software goes from one person to another. 
So let's define implicit teams as groups that work on similar parts of the software. So that's an implicit team or virtual team. And the succession would be a transfer of responsibilities to maintain and enhance the product within an implicit team. So initially one person worked on that part of the product, then somebody else. And of course they're in implicit team because they work on the same part of the product. So receiving parties follower, uh, uh, transferring party we'll call mentor. And again, those are just nominal terms. Uh, you have to look at the definition. I mean, in principle, I mean, there are many cases. I mean, those are not the most efficient transfers, but in many cases, actually mentor and follower, they don't even know about each other's existence because you know, transfer happens kind of outside their poor view. Okay? Uh, in, uh, in principle, it's always better for mentors and followers to, to communicate because they can transfer a lot of knowledge that way. Uh, but in, in general, that's not always the case. So, the objective of this particular phenomena is, is, uh, is, is how do you measure succession and, uh, uh, and its impact uh, so we can have, make some decisions about how to work in the future. So projection. Uh, so I already defined a little bit of what I mean by succession and that gives some idea of how it will be reflected in say version control systems. So engaging with the code often leads to changing the code. So we can say, okay, whenever you change the code, you are related to part of the code. The chronological order of engagements by mentors and followers should reflect the temporal order of changes. So as I said before, mentor uh, is the one who starts and follower who follows, right? So is after mentor. So that's, uh, those are two basic ideas of the projection. And if we want to reconstruct to figure out who the mentor is, we basically pick uh, first implicit teams, and that's very easy. If you change the same file with me, we are on the same implicit team. Uh, we can define it at finer level uh, or, uh, or higher level, uh, like module or perhaps line. And succession would be a peers uh, of developers where somehow we define this reverse projection from, those, from this uh, uh, data that we have that really, uh, you know, that, uh, that projection that maximizes some criteria. So I'll just describe one criteria, even though I tried a variety of them. I, I'll describe only the one that works really well. And the criteria is very simple. Suppose we have two developers. First developer made two changes. First change was done to file one, and second change was done to file two. And the second developer, who first change was done on file uh, uh, one, and the next two changes well done on file two. Now, time goes in this direction. So that for this file, that was the first change. For this file, this was the first change. So you're kind of saying, okay, so if I'm the first one, uh, I should be a mentor according to this file because I changed this file first. But uh, according to this file, this person should be the mentor because you know they changed this file first. So who is the right person here? Uh, because you have essentially a tie. Turns out that uh, um, if you weight uh, each file by the frequency, so if you are the first before some other person on one file, then you get one. If you are uh, you know, second, then you get, uh, after uh, the, another person, you get zero. So for example, developer M gets one for this file, gets zero for this file. So if you take the simplest measure, you basically get a tie. You don't know who is the mentor, who is the follower. Turns out that to resolve that kind of tie, what's useful is to uh, um, look at that, how uh, many people change that file. So if those two developers are the only ones who change this file, this file is much more important than some other big file where many other, perhaps, other people changed it. So, so if you wait by that frequency, then you get, uh, you get a slightly different measure, which I described. And that basically says, okay, this person is a mentor, this person is not, because this file is not as important in determining mentorship as this file, period. And do you include the law of a definition of mentors, a mentor with respect to a single file? Do you have different, you could have... Oh, uh, right, so uh, this, uh, this, uh, this set of mentors, followers, is defined on people, not on files. So files are just used as a way to figure out uh, that, uh, that relationship on people, on those virtual teams. So files, in, in some sense, are irrelevant to this. What we want to know is who's the mentor, who's the follower. We really don't care what they work on in that sense. So, uh, so 
in order to compare a variety of signatures that I, I tried, I selected 10 actually mentor follow peers in a project that was actually outsourced and established via interviews that here's the person who took over the work, here's the original person, and compared those uh, signatures in terms of how well they uh, performed in terms of identifying the right peer, actually identify, peer identified via interview. Uh, and and, the, and the, uh, the measure I just described on the previous slide worked uh, quite well, actually. So now I say, okay, I'm done. So let's go to the next step. Now I know, I know who's the mentor, who's the follower. And again, I should warn you, it's not necessarily that actual mentors are always identified. For example, sometimes a person A is very experienced. He mentors person B. That person mentor, per, person's mentors person C. And perhaps at some point in time, work is transferred or some other reason, and that original person mentors person D. So your signature points to person C as the mentor of person D. But in fact, it's the person A mentor because that person was most senior and perhaps he didn't have anything else to do at that time or felt like doing that. So, so in this case, this is really more of an immediate transition. So it really doesn't always identify the real true mentors. In most cases, it does. But in some cases, it doesn't. So this, but from, from what I'm trying to analyze, this definition is reasonably, reasonably good. Anyway, so now, now that I identified those peers, I went out and said, well, here's uh, 1,100 developers in a vial. For each one, let's identify who's, uh, who's a mentor, who's a follower. Well, actually 2,000, and I identified 1,000 pairs. Um, and then I said, let's look at the, some measure that people would care about. Like, for example, are followers as productive as mentors? So we look at the number of changes made per month and we have about 2,000 people or 1,000 pairs. And we have uh, this kind of ratio, ratio. So follower productivity over mentor productivity. Now, you can always object. This is not a very accurate measure of productivity because you know if it's UI, you make a lot of changes. If it's server, you make very few changes that are very high. Remember, in this case, they're all working on the same code or similar code, because we determined that these are people most close in terms of what code they work on. Yes? So uh, what I'm trying to puzzle out is what I would expect in a succession is that sort of the mentor's productivity would be high and then go to zero, and then in the meanwhile, the followers would ramp up. And really what you want to know is steady state. You know, mm -hmm. was the steady state productivity of the mentor sort of roughly the same as the steady state one of the follower. So in this case, what I'm doing is I'm saying, okay, let's take one year period before the point where I define transfer of ownership, which is at the point that follower starts uh, working. And then one year prior, let's see what mentor does. And let's see one year after that, what the follower does. That's, uh, so I restrict in time because you know, eventually people move to other areas. So if you look at the bigger intervals, it won't work. Uh -huh. And I'm not really looking at the curve over time, just saying, okay, here's one year, what's the monthly productivity of mentor? One year, what's the monthly productivity of the follower? Yes? Yeah, but if the succession is successful, the productivity of the mentor will drop to zero. Uh, product, no, no, productivity of the mentor cannot drop to zero because they have to make changes before the follower, right? Ah. So, Okay, so I'm not looking the mentor productivity after transfer. Okay, okay. And, and plus, most of the mentors actually move and do something else. So, uh, so, so in general, that, uh, that's, not, well, we'll see the results, and that's not what you worry about, definitely. Not about dropping to zero, by the way. Uh, actually, quite opposite. Anyway, so what I tried to do, I said, okay, so let's model this thing, just do a regression. So take the productivity ratio, take the log, of course, because it's highly biased, and say, okay, time, okay, calendar time. Well. Perhaps Avaya was doing that for 10 years. Perhaps they got better. Perhaps, you know, over time, this ratio improves. Uh, whether or not mentor offshore, so that's distributed development kind of factor. You know, if mentor offshore, perhaps things are not going so well because you can't talk so, so well with each other. Primary area of expertise, uh, uh, expertise you know, pri primary area of expertise. So mentors work on different parts of the product, or sometimes on multiple products. So on some products, they have a lot of experience, and some are uh, less experienced. So if you pick up a follower and the mentor happens to be 
uh, that's the area of the mentor. Usually, follower always has a subset of files that the mentor does, right? So, uh, so if this set of files is not the primary expertise of the mentor, you know, that's what it basically indicates. Expertise breadth, how many different areas expert, uh, a mentor has, project size, uh, and like three levels, and number of followers. Very simple. Uh, now, dropping to zero. So ratio seems to be always at least half. Uh, um, so you essentially, if you, if you have everything else identical and you have mentor offshore, you have half the productivity of that ratio. So that means the follower's productivity drops to a half of the mentor's productivity. The only way you can get uh, follower's productivity be equal or I mean, for obvious reasons, equal or higher than mentor's productivity. If you have small project, no offshore development, uh, it's a primary expertise area of the mentor, uh, and there's very few followers. You know, otherwise, you, you always get a drop. And, and this is, we're talking about a project where... Um, it's about uh, 50 projects, actually. Okay, but it, so, you know, one thing Microsoft does, for example, mm -hmm. when it does handoff is the handoff is supposed to be more maintenance mode where you won't see as many changes. <clears throat> but it sounds like these are handoffs where right. you expect development to just kind of continue. Right, uh, right. So, so in fact, many, most of those are handoffs where, I mean, so, some of them, by the way, not mentor offshore. Sometimes uh, these are just regular people joining the project and, you know, take a, okay, so, right. So the, many of them are, most of them are co-located, actually. It's about perhaps one, uh, uh, one quarter of them are, are offshore. Well, variety of practical implications. I, I'm pretty sure you appreciate that. Uh, <laughs> in fact, if I had this empirical rule where they would actually, in offshore location, they would ha get uh, four or five people to replace somebody uh, uh, with a lot of experience. I'm not sure that really worked very well in many projects, but at least that matched that rule. Uh, you know, obviously, we'd like to start with small and new projects, but nobody wants to start with small and new projects because nobody wants to transfer those. Those are cool, interesting projects. Take more time to transfer in some projects, you know, it's like two months and, and, and they have to be done. Uh, don't overload mentors with too many followers and focus on mentors' primary expertise. Anyway, so those are some practical, very simple practical recommendations. So, so again, uh, let's uh, scale back and say, well, why do we see those many, uh, followers that are, you know, quote unquote, so unproductive? So that's the kind of next step. Let's look at the project level. Let's try to investigate what's going on there. So in particular, one aspect that I didn't mention, I looked at the entire year period, right? But during that period, perhaps people weren't really quite uh, competent, you know, and it took a while for them to become competent. And perhaps part of the issue with the follower productivity was that they just weren't really skilled, you know, didn't have enough practice to be productive yet in that one year after uh, taking over. So looked at the concept of productivity a little bit closer. So you go like this, you say, okay, how long does it take for your project to, to, to developers to become productive? Yeah, small projects, oh, you know, our like especially contractors, oh, it takes like two weeks or, you know, but that's, uh, if you ask them harder questions, you know, say, okay, perhaps two, two months, perhaps six months. Uh, larger projects, perhaps you have answers saying like, oh, maybe 12 months or so. Um, but if you ask a different question, you ask, what kind of tasks do you do now? What kind of tasks did you do when you joined the project? You get really completely opposite responses. You say, oh, it takes several years to uh, do competent uh, and important tasks. Or we had attempted to assign mentoring tasks to developers for only two years of expertise, but had really a very unsatisfactory result, so we moved back to like at least three years of expertise and so forth. Uh, you also hear things like some simple rules, like you need at least two or three release cycles before somebody can really be uh, competent in resolving uh, issues. So that, that all points out to much longer periods of productivity. So what's going on? Why, why this productivity is not the same as competence? Okay, another definition. I hope you can handle that. Competence, equality, being adequately or well qualified, and productivity is quantity of tasks completed per unit time. Now, fluency is a concept from, I guess, speech uh, uh, 
therapy. And it basically, idea is that if you have complex sentences, a complex grammar, it takes longer for you to process them and people slow and, and, and perhaps stutter. Uh, so fluency basically is saying you, you can be productive, you can do things in as rapid as needed manner, no matter how difficult or important the task is. That's what fluency is. So let's see if we can detect those things in uh, software developers. So first, let's go with the first uh, qualitative stuff. So modification per month, uh, vertical axis, tenure, horizontal axis. There is a line, and again, I should mention that first, so this is a model again. Uh, I apologize for, for using so many models, but let me explain. So no, number of modifications per month is the response. ID is the developer identification, right? I mean, the first thing that, of course, you hear is that different developers, they do things differently. So most important thing is, of course, developer. So developer ID is number one. So this curve is really shape for average developer. And so those numbers would be, in fact, is whoever happened to be the first developer in that list, we added their coefficient and we added and we got this, this kind of curve. Anyway, but that's kind of the, uh, so in some sense, the absolute height is more or less, uh, 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 more or less random. What matters is really more relative height here. Okay, but you know we can see that it goes almost goes up three times for this large project over perhaps not a year but perhaps 24 months, and then it flattens basically, it doesn't go up. So, so to some extent they are true. Those statements that you have get productive pretty quickly. They are they are true. Um, now uh, can I ask a question? It shows 11:05. That can't be the right time, right? Yes, I think so. It is? Oh, we started at 30. Okay, good, good. good. I thought, one hour passed? I must be dreaming. Okay. And if you draw the same line for shorter, smaller projects, you get much, much better results. So you, you indeed see perhaps uh, not two, six months, but perhaps you see a plateau within seven to ten months. So people are a little bit... Uh, Optimistic as usual, but, uh, but they're not far off. But if you ask people about competencies, then you suddenly get into kind of two aspects, really, you get. One aspect is difficulty. So some tasks are just difficult to do. And unless you really are very affluent, you can't really do them. Other tasks perhaps aren't necessarily always very difficult inherently but it's just not clear what to do them, or perhaps the impact of doing them is so big that you don't want people with the not enough expertise doing them. So that's difficulty and centrality. So these are developer concerns, these are mostly manager concerns or, or architect concerns. Each one has four dimensions, and each, and each dimension has a mirror in, in the, you know, between difficulty and centrality. So for example, a typical thing is technology. People say, okay, technology, Oh, uh, you know, whatever. Java is easier than C++. You know, some nonsense like that. And uh, then uh, uh, perhaps working relationships. You know, if you really need to uh, uh, deal with a lot of people in your working relationships, that makes it more difficult. Domain, you know, some user interface is easier than perhaps server. Customer issue. Oftentimes customer issues are harder to reproduce. Not always, but sometimes they do. And again, there's a mirror image in centrality. In some projects, you know, like in Microsoft, I'm pretty sure, if it affects customer, you know, there's a lot of, it's important, so you don't want to screw it up. You want to provide a really good patch and so forth. So you wouldn't let a novice to do that kind of task. Again, domain, if it affects many parts of the system, you really don't want somebody with less experience to do that. Team impact, you know, if it uh, affects, it needs negotiations, communication with many people in the team, that's again, long-term impact if you change technology, oftentimes you, you, you change the way you do things in the future. So that's another aspect that's important. So this uh, line tries to look at, again, a slightly different concept of centrality of task. And this centrality of task is defined, again, that's the response. And again, the same model, idea of developer and tenure months in project. And uh, in this case, centrality is, uh, okay, so, so each month, let me try to be very clear here. Each month, you uh, modify some modules. Okay. 
suppose you modify a module that's really new and isolated. Nobody worked on it. Okay? So it has very little history. Okay? So uh, in this case, centrality is, is uh, modeled by the uh, number of past changes to the module. Okay? So that will give you very low centrality. Suppose, on the other hand, you modify a module which has 20-year history and has millions of changes. So that would be very high centrality. And so over all the MRs that you do a month, you calculate average centrality uh, for each developer, and then you fit this particular model. And then what you see is that over three years, you really don't see any plateaus whatsoever. Again, that's for a large project. Um, for smaller projects, it might be slightly different. And it depends really on dif different types of centrality that you define. But the point is really that three years might not be enough to reach fluency. That's really the key point of, the, of this chart. Uh, by the way, I want you to make sure you don't confuse with productivity. Because centrality, I have not mapped centrality to value or anything of that sort. We all know that you know, it moves, this, whatever that number is, it moved from 7.5 to 9.0. 9 is it 30% better than 7.5? Or is it 100% better? Is it a million times better? I don't know. The point is, unless you have somebody with three years of experience, you probably can't even do those tasks. Is this for data for a single project or many different projects? Uh, this is for just one other project. But this, this centrality here, how quickly you, it, it may depend if there's a lot of uh, turnaround in the project, if you have the same people for three years. And it's people about. do this central work at the beginning, we'll do still the central work at the end. So, or it's going to be slower. If you take an organization, a startup that's doubling, a sport force, and then you will be moving to the, the central stuff much faster, perhaps. I yeah, that's a good, a good point, yes. Yeah. Okay. Dimensions, uh, many dimensions of difficulty, dimensions of centrality, you can measure that, quantify growth, affluency. And again, you know, again, it's like you can't do it in two weeks, basically. That's the simple moral. <laughs> and it's very important also to retain experienced staff, because if you don't have people, at least one person with experience in a project, I mean, and, and it's, you can see in a buy it over and over again, it really, you know, it, it really destroys the project. Okay, so let's go, we see how at the project level we came up with this kind of measures of fluency, it increases over time, but the developers really vary with each other. Why, you know, what's the reason for the, the variance among developers? Why some grow so, so much faster than others? I mean, I've showed that averages, but one of the first things that people say is that some developers just never, uh, you know, ne never get off the ground. And that's, uh, that's the thing that I, is not reflected, but that was kind of a puzzle tried to address. So that led to this concept of, okay, so how do people actually learn in organizations? So there's social aspect and technical aspect. So let's separate this skill or, or fluence into two parts. So technical competency, again, let's measure something really simple, number of tasks completed. So that's practice, number of tasks completed Everybody knows. You play violin, you get better at it. You program, you get better at it. And social competency is, is basically how many different individuals you encounter in your workflow. And let's call relative sociality is the ratio of the two. So I, I picked, a, this is a medium-sized project. I picked a project and I fit the line which is I looking at just social learning. So total number of people you encountered in your workflow. And I, you know, uh, uh, con uh, condition on developer ID, when they started, because, you know, they, there could have been changes over time, how big the uh, uh, project size was at the time, and then 10 years on this horizontal side. So unlike the lines that plateaued or the line that grew up straight, this is, by the way, looks at eight years, uh, so that's much longer period. So really wanted to see what happens beyond that three-year period. What you see is, uh, first of all, some sort of bumps, but also what you see is that there's some increases after perhaps uh, half a year you see increase in learning, then it slows down, then you, after three and a half years, you, you see increase, and so forth. So there's some, 
some perhaps cycles there. I, I'm, I wouldn't overinterpret those. So this is really kind of early data. But really surprising stuff is that really perhaps learning accelerates, not necessarily decelerates. Now there is a simple explanation. Of course, after four years, many people become managers and so forth, at least technical leads. And that allows them to talk with other people as well. But that really fits into that model that perhaps you, you reach sort of a plateau of your technical competence and perhaps then you need to increase your social competence in order to continue your technical competence and vice versa. And this kind of cycle repeats itself over time. What's most surprising is that, that, uh, that, uh, that instead of learning slowing down, it actually appears to accelerate. So let's ask the other question. So those are people that obviously stayed for eight years or 10 years in the project. Uh, why do they stay for so long? So this is a very special group. Are we looking at really strange people here? So one of the things is that we all know that uh, we're sort of affected by initial environment. You join an organization and then your first impressions really do a lot of things to you about how you behave in the future. So this was an attempt to look at that uh, from software developers perspective. So, what happens if project social and relative sociality is high or low? You know, if project's relative sociality is low, perhaps joiners may receive more support and attention from existing members because, you know, they have more time and perhaps they perhaps appreciate uh, more external contributors. So that's more applies to open source, but you have uh, similar arguments for commercial projects as well. Perhaps where a few people coming in you still have a lot of work, but perhaps business is not so good, so you really appreciate and train those new people better. Uh, while if, uh, if you have a high sociality, then perhaps there is not much time to really spend on mentoring activities, and perhaps appreciation of contributions isn't as good. So the joiner who will be more likely to become a long-term contributor, and that's another definition, somebody who stays for three or more years within the project. And this is kind of an important concept because if you think about a software project, if somebody just joins for a few months and leaves, perhaps effort spent on mentoring that person was bigger than actually value the project gets. So that's kind of uh, why this, uh, this definition is, is important. And given that there's at least three years that you need to kind of get, to, get to up, the, up, the, up the level, you know, that's perhaps a reasonable definition. But perhaps it depends on the project. Perhaps for some projects, 10 years is a long-term contributor. For others, maybe, maybe it's two years. Uh, so what I plot here is the survival curve for members in the project. So red, <laughs> have I have acquired Nortel? And uh, so now we have this um, Nortel blue, or Avaya red and Avaya blue. So Avaya blue, I think, is the part that came from Nortel. Avaya red is the part that came from Lucent. Anyway, so just to give you an explanation, Nortel is kind of also a telecom company. It's just the split from AT&T many eons ago. And the interesting part is that it has exactly the same portfolio as Avaya because Avaya just bought the enterprise part of Nortel. So we have all the same products. We have approximately the same number of people. Uh, so it's interesting to compare the two. So the survival curve, let me give you an example of how survival curve is interpreted. So here's the number of months with the project. So it goes from 0 to 250. And then there's uh, for people who join at the, lows, uh, um, at the low relative sociality levels, it's this line with L's, and high and medium, uh, those other two lines. So you see uh, for each, uh, for each uh, so you see, say, for 150, so it picks 150. So you say that uh, people who joined at low sociality about 18% state at least 150 months with the project, okay? And, uh, uh, and, uh, and for uh, people who join during medium and high sociality, there's maybe about 5%. So there's about three times difference between the two. Now, if we see, look at the uh, blue, which is another part of Avaya, you see, <laughs> You, you see actually a very different picture, and I, I could get into explanation uh, perhaps why it may be so. But you see a very different pattern. It's much bigger difference between the, between the two groups. Okay? And uh, here are some two projects, parallel projects, one project in Avaya, one project in Nortel that are, do exactly the same. So, and this is Mozilla. This is open source project. And again, you see, uh, you see also, and this is, I believe, GNOME. Uh, where is GNOME? Yes. So you see that. There's some variation between projects. So why there is variation, even though 
uh, well, I guess GNOME and Mozilla both use interface, but they're quite different. But, uh, but these are really identical functionality, and these companies are also uh, identical. So why there is such a difference between the two? So that leads to our next question, which is perhaps there are some culture differences. So perhaps we could look at the even higher level at society and see what's going on here. <laughs> Uh, so what I did here is I extracted those uh, 800 or so different Wikipedias. This is English, this is Swedish, this is Chinese. Uh, I just plot the, uh, kind of uh, just for fun, I plotted the activity in each one of these. Uh, and also looked at the relative sociality, which is calculated not with respect to MR, but with respect to a particular article which people edited. And again, you see very similar uh, pattern, though in Wikipedias that pattern perhaps is more due to the fact that the relative sociality in the beginning was much lower than at the end, and people at the beginning are more likely to stay longer than the ones that joined at the end. So it seems that uh, it, if you really look at the increase in tenure, so you can actually go and say uh, what uh, percentage increase in predicted tenure, and so you pick Avaya, for Avaya overall you get about 60% increase in tenure. Uh, for GNOME, perhaps uh, 100%, so you double. Uh, for Mozilla, perhaps not much, and so forth. And then you see Mozilla is kind of similar like Chinese uh, Wikipedia. So you say, okay, so perhaps there's some uh, cultures that are both in development and perhaps at the national level that, uh, that have effects uh, uh, that we are observing the differences of. Uh, to finish the talk, I wanted to just quickly go over some other things that I think are important to realize. One is that I noticed over time that it's good to look at individual projects, but some questions are very difficult to answer if you just look at individual projects. So perhaps you want to look at entire company, like code growth, productivity, and so forth. Perhaps you want to look at entire culture, say in open source, and so forth. And, and for that purpose, I'm trying to collect uh, data that covers both all the open source and hopefully you know, uh, all the industry. Uh, and there's some uh, collaborators that provide some equipment and, and uh, you know, network equipment, et cetera, and I, I, listed, I listed those here. So Avaya stuff is done, of course, on Avaya systems, but those other things are, are done on those other systems as well. Um, so I wanted to give an example. So, so here is all the defects in uh, uh, Avaya and Nortel combined. And what I'm plotting over time is number of people involved in resolving them. So I'm not plotting number of people in employed. I'm just a number of people involved in the workflows in those defects. Okay? And it kind of grows and uh, goes down, you know, after the, I guess, you know, Nortel went bankrupt. Uh, you know, Avaya wasn't doing that well. They bought Nortel. So it went down quite substantially, right, the number of people. But if you look at the green line, which is the activity actions, it's like assign MR, resolve MR, do transfer work, and so forth. The actions in those MRs, or number of MRs, really doesn't, doesn't drop, it continues on. So you can kind of say, okay, there seems to be a huge uh, productivity increase there. Uh, and if you go backwards in time, perhaps you also can see uh, also some sort of productivity increase uh, uh, at this point, again, that's another time of perhaps downsizing after the uh, internet uh, bubble burst. Um, as regards to this, uh, all, the, all, all version control systems in the world, this was data from collected from four years ago. And at that time, you know, th so that's Avaya, then various forges and so forth, and, and the amount of code, the amount of changes, etc. Just to give an idea, at this time I had about 150, uh, 180, maybe 200,000 different version control repositories. Right now, I have a list of, uh, of around 600,000 version control repositories. So it's been a, kind of an explosion in terms of, uh, of the amount of code that's being put out. And at that time, I said, look, I mean, in Avaya, we almost have more code than in all open source, but that really uh, is rapidly changing as we speak. So let's get back to this uh, conclusion that uh, <laughs> trying to either uh, save ourselves or be content that I think it's, um, 
been many times mentioned that, you know, how much can you do about uh, a version control data, uh, I mean, over the years. But uh, um, I noticed that many universities, many companies, they really uh, invest very heavily in, uh, in software mining right now. And I don't think that's uh, uh, a bubble. Uh, I think uh, there's the value that could be extracted is still very high. It's just the question is how do you make sure that those projections are really relevant, uh, at least to yourself, perhaps to project, community, society, and perhaps that they're lasting. So that's, uh, that's all. Thank you very much. Oh. Oh. There's a data point. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's, it's micro. <laughs> Good question. Sorry about taking so much time, but I just uh, couldn't contain myself. <laughs> so you said you're recording, I'll just pick on the end of the talk, you said you're recording 600,000 projects. Uh, no, uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And oh, their whole version history. It's probably not feasible to run the experiments on all of them like the kinds of things that you're doing now? Well, not in that detail. So that's the point, is that you ask different questions and try to ask. So my main, main point is what I'm trying to do with those 600,000 repositories is I create a huge hash table where I put all the con key is the content of each version of each file. Mm -hmm. And then I'm saying, OK, in which projects does this, is, is this file occurs? And then I do transitive closure, I'm saying, if this files occur, if this version matches that version in those two projects, then the entire version histories must match. So I'm saying, okay, these actually parallel developments of the same functionality. Uh, I can answer. Yeah. Okay. My question is a little bit different, actually. Okay. It's more about like, so you're recording all this stuff before you have an idea of what experiment or what study you want to do on the data, and mm -hmm. it sounds like. That's a great social service if that were publicly available for any set of huge number of grad students who want to do data mining. But what benefit does it give you or Avaya to build this huge repository as opposed to only gathering it as you need to study? Um, there's two issues. Yeah, so, so, so let me get That's a very good question. So I have this other aspect, which is I try to do data salvaging. For example, many of the Nortel products, of course, will be discontinued or Avaya products. And so I'm trying to kind of recover that before it disappears because, you know, we've got 30 years of, you know, thousands of people working on some pretty good products that will go out the window. So something could be learned from that. So I'm looking at that as data salvaging and, and many open source projects, in fact, do data does disappear and so forth. Um, well, I, I look at it as public service, let's put it this way. I mean, my feeling is if I won't do it, nobody else will do so, you know, so I might as well do it. So, and then hopefully somebody gets inspired that takes it over. So to some extent, I'm having success. So I, I, you know, but, uh, but yeah, it's... Uh, <laughs> uh, for Avaya, principally what uh, Avaya uh, use, uh, I mean, I, I, right now I moved it off Avaya service for the most part. But for Avaya, the principal value is that, I mean, one of the things you can do, you basically say, I can say, okay, here's a buy code. Here's a buy code that's borrowed from open source because I have a version or a, you know similarity to this project there. So that way, at least I can say what's a buy, what's not a buy. Uh, um, and you know, in many cases, you know, there's all sorts of licensing issues uh, that could be. You know, that's actually quite useful. Services like that are fairly expensive, and people have business models on that. I'm not really trying to get into that space. But I do have some questions. I mean, I didn't have time to really talk about, but I have a number of questions which I think can be answered only if you have a, uh, a full set. Like, for example, copying, you know, innovation, right, spread of innovation. If you have just one project, you really can't say, you know, how much innovation is in open source. It's just impossible. And even if you have sample, it's very difficult. But with a complete set of census, you, you can answer. I mean, similar, if you, think, uh, uh, if you think of why census is done, I mean, sometimes it's for political reasons. But other reasons, uh, more kind of uh, business reasons, that's basically the same reasoning you can apply to here. I'm just wondering, so Avaya, for instance, uh, I mean, 
And regarding distributed development, I mean, as, do you, have you have you been able to reach some conclusions that uh, management paid too attention to, or uh, is it af or after the fact, basically you? Uh, okay, so 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 let's put it this way. I mean, in some sense, Hawaii is, is a great place to do study because there's so many incompetent decisions it seems to be made. But you know, let's. Uh, but I think that's being done everywhere. I think Microsoft probably doesn't does have its own share of, of things. And, and let's understand that. They are incompetent, perhaps, from software development perspective. Perhaps those decisions are reasonable from business perspective. As, as, as I go through life, I kind of start to understand that. Now, however stupid it, it seems from you know, software development perspective, sometimes there's a good business reason. Or perhaps you know, somebody benefits from it but anyway. So, the, so that's the first point. Uh, second point is, for example, I really my study of organizational change, and Avaya has like 30% churn. I mean, it's uh, right now our you know many projects. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, basically, <laughs> I'll give you. An, I don't want to be too winded, but so we outsource some of this stuff to I believe uh, Wipro, and uh, one of the projects was outsourced to them. And they guarantee, and whatever they agreed is for two years for people to stay on the project. Well, what they didn't think of is that after they stay for two years, they move on 100%. What do you do then when you have a release two, two months down the road? So anyway, that's, uh, um, you know, so, so I mean, you can argue that there isn't foresight. But, but there are a number of uh, uh, things that, for example, those, contra those experts hired as contractors were as, as a result of that. Uh, as uh, you know, really, com you know, they really stopped offshoring for uh, you know half a year or a year just to kind of get back and say, okay, you know, uh, let's do it better. So, so it's uh, you know, so there are some signature uh, signs of, of improvement. You just mentioned the distinction between um, looking at these histories from a software development perspective versus a business perspective. And actually, the business perspective is something, well, I've done my fair share in software mining as well, but the business perspective is something that I would always be very interested in, but where I would have lots of difficulties actually acquiring the appropriate data. Mm -hmm. So for instance, um, for instance, um, it was all, for open source projects, it's always in, almost impossible to get a reasonable estimate of the effort that went into individual changes. Mm -hmm. And you cannot simply take chain, the number of changes as a proxy for that because right. the same effort may flow into one single combined change. Right, as right. Well as in it many depends how people work changes. and so forth. Uh, another, thing is, uh, another thing also from a uh, more economical perspective is mm -hmm. um, that uh, not all changes and not all consequences are equal. Absolutely. There obviously are, there, there very obviously are bugs which, are, which must be worth uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Mm -hmm. Because some of my students are, cur are currently collecting this into in bug bounties. Mm -hmm. and there's many other bugs which are simply, which are simply trivial and Absolutely. easy to fix. And many bugs actually are, are even ignored by developers because Absolutely. they would be Absolutely. because they, they would simply improve maintenance uh, if if anything. Uh, if you do a if you do a static bug checker and you my my answer is. It will provide you employment for a long time in the future because it's not so simple. I mean, that's the, yeah. the, the, the whole point. Uh, and I completely agree with all those statements. And I think uh, that's why we need skill. That's why we need people that uh, understand how to do that well. Because otherwise, you know, you, you know, if you, unless you take care of how you do things. But I'm sorry for interrupting. But uh, perhaps uh, you haven't finished your point. But I completely agree with that. Yeah. So, so my question, my question, so actually I'm not trying to raise a point, but the question mm -hmm. is, uh, what does this imply for the collection of data? Mm -hmm. And also what does this, in, so in terms of effort in particular, mm -hmm. and what does this, in, and also as it comes to the, mm -hmm. as it comes to risk, mm -hmm. if there's a very, few, a very small number of issues which may be worth millions, and mm -hmm. millions of issues which may be worth nothing, right. uh, how does this, uh, how, how can we reflect this in research? So, so, so let me just uh, uh, go. So the methodology is really has been developed by that guy that did this history stuff. I mean, that's that's the guy who really did all the. I mean, if you read, I mean, he summarizes how he verified the data, how he collected, how he, uh, and so forth. It was uh, partly numeric data, partly uh, opinion data, but you know, he did that a long time ago. And if you read carefully, that's really how you should do empirical work. Other thing is so so that's really. I mean, I'm not going to contribute anything there. 
What I'm going to say, though, is that it really depends on what you're trying to do. So if you're trying to look at bugs as a cost, it does, you know, the important bugs perhaps aren't as much difficult, different as small bugs as long as they take time to compute. If you're really are looking at customer impact, that's a completely different story. Then perhaps you should focus on that. If you look at the safety issues, then, then that's even yet another story. So that's my kind of point that, you know, from quality perspective, you really need to pick a domain, a context, and then understand exactly what you're trying to do before saying that this is the right thing to do. And I don't think there is a right answer, and that's why I think there's a lot of work for us to figure out what are the right domains, how, what do you do in each one, what's the, you know, the right measure for each one. So I, I certainly agree with that. missing when you gather the electronic repositories but you don't have the, people the you know the MTV story of the H1 you know story of each person and their history <laughs> and what they did for the project and why and what their motivation was yeah so uh, that's what I that's the next place I want to go is to figure out motivation so my hope is as follows is like archaeologists do the same thing right they don't have any contact with those people that died perhaps 20,000 years ago <laughs> Uh, but what I'm using is this, this phrase by Thucydides that says, he kind of nicely said, human things. <laughs> Where past resembles the future if it doesn't reflect it. So the point is you can learn about something from where you, you can actually talk to people and understand what they're doing and what traces they leave, and then extrapolate that appropriately to instances where you don't have any contact. And that's really the, my primary kind of uh, borrowing of strength, this exp explanation uh, that this terminology in statistics. But I mean, that's kind of the main, uh, main idea is, is because, yeah, you always will have a lot of stuff where you have, you know, people died basically, and so you don't know what's going on. Right. There where you want to do anthropology, where you can do anthropology instead of archaeology. Exactly, exactly. And then, yeah, and that's where. <laughs> <laughs> and digital anthropology perhaps is the next, next wave.